The very first character you encounter in Persona 3, Yukari Takiba, is someone who may come off as harsh, but just like I said from Makoto in his analysis, there's a lot more than meets the eye for her, and she's a very interesting and compelling character. She went through a massive character arc, and it's one I love a lot for how realistic it feels. In this video, I'll be going over Yukari's growth as a character, and as always, I'll also be going over the mythology and reasoning of her Persona choices as well. We'll be going over Persona 3's The Journey and The Answer. I won't be going over Arena or the other spinoffs in this video because her character arc is more or less complete by the end of The Answer, so it's a bit redundant to go any further than that in my eyes. Also, like my two other Persona analysis videos, I'll be using the movies and the games as a reference since they both do a good job of developing her as a character. So there's a lot to uncover and I don't want to waste any of your time, so let's get into the background of Yukari. Yukari is a complicated girl with many internal problems as she tends to hide behind her upbeat and cheerful personality. She's an archer at her school Gekukan High, and that alongside her personality and appearance makes her popular as a result. On the surface, she seems to be fairly easygoing with a healthy outlook on life, but on the inside, she struggles with loneliness and fear because of her past. Yukari lost her father around 10 years ago during an experiment led by the Kirijo group, and when he died, Yukari's life spiraled pretty out of control. Her mother started jumping from guy to guy to cope with losing her husband, and Yukari can't stand that because she feels it isn't right or fair to her dad. She believes clinging to people and running away from your problems is the worst thing you can do, so she secludes herself because she doesn't want to be like her mom, so she comes across as harsh as a result. The only person she's able to talk to comfortably about this for a while is Makoto because he too lost his parents 10 years ago, so she feels he understands what she's going through and vice versa. In Persona 3 Reload, her loneliness is only added upon in the hangout events in the dorm. During the one where you watch a show with her, she reveals that when she was younger, she had a childhood friend that she was close to for a while, but she started to ignore her. It wasn't because Yukari herself did anything wrong, but her reputation of being her father's daughter, the one involved in that experiment, was tarnished by rumors spread by people, so her friend's mother said they couldn't be friends anymore, and this led to her wanting to be more strong and independent. She does value people in her relationships despite all of this however, and that's why she's a part of the Lover's Arcana. The Lover's Arcana represents things like attraction, love, relationships, choice, moral values, balance, and many other things. The Lover's was chosen for Yukari because like I said a moment ago, she does value her relationships, but that's not the only thing. She is also popular in school, and her choice to seclude herself in pursuit of perfection and becoming distant from her mother can represent her moral values. This is a common theme between all of the Lover's Arcana, the three modern Persona ones being Yukari, Risei, and An. All three of them are popular, have some sort of mask they put on around others for one reason or another, and care about those around them. They also have fairly similar personality traits, that being upbeat and cheerful. Back onto Yukari herself though, her character design represents these traits well. She loves cutesy things, she's fashionable, and her favorite color is pink. Her most iconic design is her Gekukan winter uniform, where she has a white choker with a heart, a pink cardigan, the cute red ribbon female Gekukan uniforms are known for, a black skirt, and knee-high socks with hearts on them. Out of all the female party members in Persona 3, I'd have to say Yukari's is the most fashionable and unique, which fits her perfectly as her character. So now that we have a basic understanding of her personality and past, I want to transition into her first tier persona, which is Io. Io was a mortal lover of Zeus, an Argive princess, and an ancestor of many kings and heroes. She was a priestess to Hera, the goddess of marriage, women, and family, and Hera was the wife of Zeus. Zeus lusted after Io, who was a mortal woman. Hera found out about this, so Zeus turned Io into a cow to try to hide it, but Hera found out anyways. After she had found out, she made Zeus turn Io into a heifer, which is a term for a young female cattle. After that, Hera received her as a gift and put her under the watch of Argus, which was a giant with a hundred eyes. Hermes was sent by Zeus to free Io, and he did so by putting Argus to sleep. Not all was well though, because after she was freed, she was still in her heifer form. And not only that, Hera sent a stinging gadfly to essentially torture her and put her in constant pain. There was still some hope, however. She came across Prometheus, who assured her that she could regain her human form and become the ancestress of Hercules, one of the greatest heroes to ever exist. Io eventually managed to escape across the Ionian Sea to Egypt and was given back her human form by Zeus. Io's journey throughout Greek mythology is a representation of the resilience of a human stuck in between the matters of god and goddesses. Despite the immeasurable amount of suffering Io went through, she kept moving forward and eventually found salvation after reaching Egypt and regaining her mortal body. Io could represent Yukari in a few ways. 
After the death of her father, growing distant from her mother, and seeming like she was forced into joining the fight against Shadows, she felt like she was trapped, and this was extremely painful as a result. Io was also trapped in the form of a heifer and forced to roam aimlessly as the gadfly constantly tormented her, so this is parallel in that aspect of being confined into something you never wanted in the first place. It's also why Io's design in Persona 3 is half cow. Despite this, both Io and Yukari never gave up, and both are partly in thanks to people being there for them. Prometheus was there for Io to reassure her she would regain her mortal body and become Hercules' ancestress, and Cease, especially Makoto, were there for Yukari when she felt like she had no reason to fight any longer, but that'll be elaborated upon later on. All Yukari ever wanted was to be free from her shackles, and this struggle is what drives her toward growth throughout the whole game. As Persona 3 progresses, and we learn more about her, the Dark Hour, and everything that happens throughout, she starts to break through the shackles forced upon her to live a life she desires. Now with Yukari's backstory and first tier Persona detailed, we can get into the start of the story. Starting off from the very beginning of Reload, there's a scene where Yukari is trying to find the power to use her evoker, but she just can't bring herself to do it. This demonstrates her fear of death very early on, but this doesn't mean she's a coward or anything of the sort. Quite the opposite, in fact. As Makoto enters the dorm for the first time during the Dark Hour, Yukari is the first to confront him since to her knowledge, no one else besides Cease should be awake during that time. Despite being suspicious and apprehensive about Makoto, Yukari still leads him to his room and helps him out the following day during his first visit to Gekokan High. She shows him the path to get to school and leads him in the right direction once they get there. Her upbeat and cheerful personality is in full display here as well, which is shown when they first arrive at the school gates. Her popularity is also hinted at too. Something to keep in mind about Yukari is how she acts towards Junpei. She thinks he's a total idiot and can be pretty harsh toward him by calling him things like Stupe or just making sarcastic comments toward him. This isn't too important at this moment in time, but as the game goes on it becomes an important but somewhat subtle detail to her character. Anyway, in the movies, shortly after Junpei is introduced, Mitsuru calls a meeting with Yukari and the chairman regarding Makoto. They talk about his potential of persona as well as his past, which Yukari is against the latter part, especially when asked to basically spy on him. She basically has to do so though, and when she does, she learns that the two of them share similar stories. Both lost a parent 10 years ago, or in Makoto's case both. It's likely in this moment she felt some sort of faint connection and care for Makoto, which is demonstrated several times over going forward. A couple of days later, during the dark hour, everyone is continuing to keep tabs on Makoto to observe his potential, but then an attack on the dorm begins. Akihiko is injured, and shadows begin spreading all over the dorm. In the movies, Yukari wakes Makoto up, and they make an attempt to flee to the rooftop, but then Makoto suddenly stops to look outside at the moon, and this leads to an important back and forth. <laughs> Once they make it to the rooftop, a massive shadow of the Magician Arcana makes its appearance. Yukari, with no alternative, has to use her evoker and summon her persona, but she just cannot bring herself to do it. Her will to face death is just not strong enough, and because of it, she's attacked and hurt by the shadow. In this moment, to protect Yukari, Makoto awakens to his persona, Orpheus, and takes out the shadow. Afterward, he passes out, and Yukari is extremely worried, as you would expect. Makoto is hospitalized for 8 days and wakes back up on April 17th, and Yukari has been checking up on him, showing she's really thankful and worried. She shares her regret that she couldn't help him at all on the roof, and then she tells Makoto about her past, specifically her father and mother. Since I've detailed a lot of this beforehand, I'll just show the most important parts. This was a while ago, but there was a big explosion in the area. Supposedly, my dad died in the blast, but nobody really knows what happened. At the time, he was working in a lab run by the Kirijo group, so I'm hoping if I stick around long enough, I'll find out more about it. While I was waiting, I thought to myself, I've been hiding so many things from him. As soon as he wakes up, I'll tell him the truth. So thanks for listening. I've been wanting to share that story with someone for a long time. This references the point I was making near the start regarding her view on relationships and the immense love she had for her dad. The only reason she's compelled to stick around to fight the shadows is to uncover the truth of what happened to her dad, and she confides in Makoto since they share similar fates. 
As I said before, Yukari hides her past and her feelings from people because she doesn't want to rely on other people like her mom, and this is her first step to growing in that aspect. The following night, on April 18th, the members of Cease explain what their role is and tell Makoto the whole deal with the dark hours, shadows, and all that good jazz. Yukari is very quiet here, that is until they ask him to join the team and he accepts. She's surprised at how casually he accepts since she hates the dark hour and fears death, and she's also shocked at how no one else sees it as odd, demonstrating her care and worry for Makoto yet again, and also a first glimpse at her frustration with the group. Similarly to Junpei, there's something else to keep in mind, and that's Yukari's feelings toward Mitsuru. She has these feelings of disdain toward her because of the way she acts, and also for the way she treats the work they do in seats. She doesn't necessarily hate her or anything, but these feelings she has linger around and become important over time. This will be elaborated upon as it becomes relevant, but just know she really does not like Mitsuru much early on in the story. In the movie, after Makoto, Junpei, and Yukari bring Akihiko something he was asking for in the hospital, Makoto heads home on his own while Junpei and Yukari take the train together. They talk about what they think about Makoto, and Junpei thinks he's annoying at first, but then he brings up an important question. What Yukari says here goes back to what I've been saying a lot up to this point. She points out how Makoto fights just because he was told to without caring for the reason, and she understands how lonely that probably is because she is lonely herself. As I've reiterated many times since it's so vital to her character, she hides how she truly feels and thinks, so she can empathize with Makoto a lot, and it makes her worried for him. The difference is that Yukari does fight for a very particular reason, and the fact that Makoto just does it to do it also makes her annoyed and agitated. Skipping forward to the next full moon operation on May 9th, they are sent to take down the priestess arcana that has taken over the railway that they use to commute to and from school. As they board the train, it begins speeding off on its own. Junpei runs off on his own because he doesn't want to feel inferior to Makoto, and he's willing to let him do so, but Yukari emphasizes that he's a part of the team and they need to help him. Soon after, they're made aware that if they don't stop the train, they're going to collide with another one and crash out, which would obviously kill them all. They fight against the many shadows and actually make some use of good teamwork to defeat the priestess shadow, but they're running out of time to stop the train before it crashes. Makoto runs to the control room and makes a guess to stop the train, and is thankfully successful. In the movie, her annoyance toward this aspect of Makoto is shown a little bit more than the game, where her expression says a lot. Going a bit further ahead to June 1st, during the night the team gather around, and Junpei does his goofy ghost telling story moment regarding the event of Fuka's disappearance alongside a few others going missing that's pretty iconic, and Yukari actually gets really scared about it. She makes a statement that she'll prove the story isn't ghost related and goes out in search of evidence. Now aside from the fact that the ghost story is pretty funny and gives an opportunity to continue the narrative, it can also represent Yukari's fear of death, since her fear is the most extreme case out of anyone on the team. Something else that I mentioned before is represented well about 5 days later, and that's Yukari's bravery despite her fear. Yukari did her research on everything that happened regarding the girls that went missing at school and debunks the ghost theory, and traces their hangout spot back to the back alley behind Port Island Station. It's a place where a bunch of delinquents hang out at, and Yukari says they need to go there to figure out the truth. Junpei is super reluctant even up to the very moment they get there, but Yukari shows no notion of backing down. She even stands up to the punks trying to get in their way. Come on, don't be intimidated by these punks. Shinjiro comes and helps them out, at which point they get the answers they came for. They learn Fuka has been missing for a while and she could be dead, and this leads to the investigation to find out what happened. It turns out Fuka's friend, Natsuki, had been bullying and teasing Fuka, and one night her alongside her friends locked Fuka in the gym. Since Tartarus is in the school and she entered in a random way, she could realistically be anywhere. Yukari in the movies acts quite a bit differently than she does in the game during this moment. During the questioning of Natsuki, they question why Fuka doesn't have apathy syndrome like the other victims of the shadows, at which point this back and forth occurs. <laughs> I don't think I need to explain why this angers her at this point because I believe we all get it by now. That following night, they discuss what to do about Fuka and how to go about it. 
To sum it up, they deduce that she's been in there for what is roughly 10 hours in dark hour time, and they all decide to go into Tartarus the same way Fuka did so they can have the best chance of finding her. This leads to yet another moment between Makoto and Yukari, but this one is very important and is something I've been hinting at this whole time. わかりました。本当にわかってるの。どうしたんだよ、ゆかりっち。私は真田先輩みたいに立派な決意みたいなのないけど、それでも自分の力で助けられる人がいるなら助けたいって思う。山岸さんのことも助けてあげたい。どう
After Makoto gets down, Yukari vents out her frustration that someone is always protecting her and getting hurt because of it. So in the only time I can think of in the entire game, she uses direct commands on her own to knock the shadow off its feet, heal herself and Makoto, and then becomes the first out of anyone and ceases to make use of the Theurgy ability. Wait, is this? Yukari-chan, load the cartridge into your evoker! I know, now's the time. Yukari being the first to use Theurgy is super fitting because in order to use it, your emotions need to be running high in battle, and Yukari is by far the most emotional member of Cease. She got so tired of feeling useless that she turned that frustration into a newfound power of hers, and let me tell you, I think that shit is badass as hell. She'll continue to downplay herself and her achievements by saying things like I got lucky or it was nothing, but she's definitely got more than luck on her side. Now that Fuka and Yukari are fairly close now, she asks Fuka for a favor. She wants her to look into Tartarus and their school. She's suspicious because Mitsuru acts weird when the topic is brought up, so she wants to know the truth since it could help her in her overall goal of figuring out what happened to her dad. Going back to Yukari and her emotions, that first example actually isn't the only time this is shown either. During the next full moon operation on July 7th, Yukari does something that again, no one else replicates in the game at this point. Once they fight the Lover's Arcana, due to things happening a moment prior, she's pissed off and wants that Lover's Arcana gone. So no matter what your Theurgy meter is at, it will be put to the max. This never happened again, at least on my playthrough which is a bit odd to me, but I think that's more of a me thing since I had a pretty similar party throughout the whole game. Regardless, it's still a very cool moment for her and again reiterates the point. So you know how I've been talking about how she feels everyone's being used to fight against the shadows and how she's suspicious of Mitsuru? Well, all of that was a build up to this moment. On July 11th, everyone has a meeting to discuss the previous full moon operation, and this is where Yukari brings up all of her suspicions. She deduces that the accident from 10 years ago has something to do with the Dark Hour and Tartarus, and that Mitsuru has been hiding this from them. She explains that the accident from 10 years ago was a result of experiments conducted by her grandfather. They were collecting shadows, and suddenly an accident occurred, which led to the creation of the Dark Hour and Tartarus. We know that the accident was a result of Yukari's father, but I'll get to that in a moment. The experiments were being conducted at the school, and that really pisses off Yukari because it really does come off as her being used, which is very understandable because she kind of was. The only reason she's able to calm down at all is because it wasn't really their fault in the first place, so she can forgive them a little bit. Some people might get annoyed at Yukari for how she acts in moments like these, but let's seriously think about this for a minute. You know your father died 10 years ago while conducting an experiment for the Kurijo group, which is Mitsuru's family, and you find out she knew something about it that she didn't tell anyone. Now also imagine that learning the truth about the whole incident is your only reason for fighting. Now if you ask me, I think that's more than enough of a valid reason to get a little pissed off in that moment where you feel you've been deceived. And it isn't like Yukari hates either of them even then. Before they all go on the trip to Yakushima, Yukari goes up to Mitsuru and apologizes to her for the way she acted during the meeting, and Mitsuru reveals that there was one person who survived that incident, and that was her father, which somewhat changes her perspective on Mitsuru, both positively and negatively. Of course, she still doesn't like the fact that she was left out of the loop, but it explains why she's so adamant about getting new members to explore and end the Dark Hour. Unfortunately, we gotta go right back into some more bad news for Yukari. During the Yakushima trip, Mitsuru's father decides to tell everyone the truth about what happened 10 years ago, and what is shown as a big moment for Yukari's character. To sum it up, the recording seemingly incriminates Yukari's dad as the reason for the dark hour, the shadows existing, and the death of many people. And as soon as she thought she could understand Mitsuru a bit, she blames her for keeping her out of the loop once again. If we're being honest with ourselves, this is a very normal reaction considering what she just seemingly learned. Of course, we know that later on Yukari's dad actually wasn't the one at fault, but that's besides the point. In Yukari's eyes, she was left out of the loop and used to clean up the mess that took her father's life in the first place. And not only that, everything she's had to endure up to this point was seemingly because of him as well. She placed her undying trust and love into her father, and now everything is crumbling all at once. She runs off on her own after that, at which point Makoto comes to console her. As I've said, they share a similar past, so she doesn't feel as bad about telling him about how she feels. 
She tells him about all the things I said a moment ago about how she feels, but to a deeper extent. And I love this scene. She feels as if she's lost a reason to fight, and she feels jealous that Mitsuru's father got to live, but hers or Makoto's didn't. At which point she feels terrible for even thinking that. Well, let's just say that didn't age well, but you know. Anyway, Makoto helps her calm down and think through all of this a bit more rationally. And she says something that shows her view of what it means to have the power of Persona. And it reveals a lot about how she views and thinks about things in general. You know, I've been thinking lately. Once you awaken to the power of Persona, you remember everything that happens during the dark hour. In exchange for power, you can no longer look away from the things you don't want to see. We can't escape reality, can we? I guess we've just gotta stay strong, huh? Despite the power of Persona being something that forces you to acknowledge the parts of you and others that you might not want to see, and after learning the supposed truth about her father, she makes it clear that she's not going to give up until she sees things through to the very end. A good example of her bravery, strength, determination, and her care to help those around her. At this point in the video, we've got a lot of the important aspects of Yukari detailed, so we'll be speeding up a good bit. Moving ahead to the next full moon operation on August 6th, Seas make their way to an underground war bunker to find the Justice and Chariot Arcana. And on their way down there, they're intercepted by a rival group of Persona users by the name of Shrega. This is their first time meeting, and they spout their beliefs and demean all of the reasons for fighting to get rid of the Dark Hour. And Yukari is the first to lash down to make it clear she gets no enjoyment out of it whatsoever. And unlike some of the others, she shows no hesitation in saying it either. She doesn't even humor what they're saying, nor does she let it affect what she fights for. That being to finish what she started and defeat the Dark Hour. This is a very small detail, but these small moments add up in the big picture and just reinforce the things I've been saying. Going way onward in the story to October 4th is yet another full moon operation. And this is what I've mentioned in every other analysis thus far since it's so important to the narrative. During the dark hour, the group, Barkin and Shinjiro, who are off just having a lovely and chipper conversation, go to the Polonia strip mall to defeat the Fortune and Strength Arcana. Once they defeat it, Mitsuru and Akihiko remember what the date is, and realize that Ken is probably planning to kill Shinji as they speak. Unfortunately for them, their worries were correct. Shinjiro gets shot twice while protecting Ken from Takaya and loses his life as a result. Since Yukari's main objective, besides learning the truth about her father and the experiments, has been to protect people from dying, this is a moment that hits her hard. She might not have known Shinjiro very well, but his passing and everyone's responses to it afterward are something she would think about a lot thereafter. The day following his death, her first thought was whether Akihiko would be okay or not since they were best friends demonstrating once again her love and care for those around her, just in case we needed more examples of that aspect about her character. A while after that, the supposed final arcana they'll need to defeat to end the dark hour closes in, and on October 24th, Mitsuru and Yukari have this conversation together. Senpai, what are you fighting for? Well, I... I guess you could say... it's my way of atoning for the past. In my case, I don't think I really have a reason anymore. I mean, I know the whole story about my father now. I guess I could still fix the mistakes he left behind, though. Maybe I should have thought about this earlier, huh? But it took me this long to start questioning myself. It seems like everyone has their own reason for fighting. Well, defeating the shadows is probably a good enough reason, huh? What are you trying to say? I'm not exactly sure, but it's all gonna be over after the next full moon, so there's not much point in thinking about it. This moment of dialogue shows she's been fighting with no clear motive ever since the Yakushima beach trip and beyond. Granted, we basically already knew that, but she's now comfortable enough to talk about it to someone else, and the fact that it was Mitsuru of all people is telling of how she's beginning to appreciate and value her friendship with Mitsuru more over time. Speaking of Mitsuru, I'm not quite done talking about her yet. After they defeat the Hanged Man Arcana and supposedly end the Dark Hour, everyone decides to have a celebration party. That is until the Dark Hour doesn't end, which honestly is a massive shock, you know, I never would have seen that development coming. Shit, maybe Yukari's sarcasm is getting to me now, damn it. Anyways, the bells ring at Tartarus, and the sea's chairman Ikutsuki has taken control of Aegis and reveals that the 12 shadows they have defeated have brought upon the fall, which will spell the end of the world. They get tied up and essentially crucified, and Mitsuru's father sacrifices himself to stop Ikutsuki. 
they get freed by Aegis, and as Mitsuru mourns over her now deceased father, I'm sure Yukari's previous feelings of jealousy have come back to bite her in the ass. She more than almost anyone understands how difficult this is, and to have it happen in front of everyone is just not something she would want to see to happen to anyone. As a result, she makes an effort to be there for Mitsuru no matter what thereafter. Now that the chairman is a certified op and died after the previous event, they decided to clean out his room, and Fuka gives Yukari something important. It's the unedited recording of her father, and it reveals the actual truth of what he did during that experiment that cost him his life. It was never his fault, and the only reason the world didn't end right then and there is because he let all of the shadows go, which resulted in the creation of Tartarus and the Dark Hour. And from this point, I want to let this scene play out since it's so important. I have just one request. Whoever finds this, please give my daughter Yukari this message. I know I promised I'd be home soon, and I'm sorry to break that promise. But I want you to know, as your father, I was never happier in my life than when I was with you. This really is my dad. I love you, Yukari. Please, take care of yourself. Dad? Dad? <laughs> I know one thing for sure now. I was right to believe in you. I'm doing okay. It took a while, but I finally got your message. So Yukari, having now found the answer to the question she's been fighting and looking for this whole time, awakens Io into Isis. Isis was a goddess in ancient Egyptian religion that was the wife of Osiris. They were one of the most worshipped deities, and Isis inherits aspects from other goddesses. Osiris was killed by Seth, and so Isis traveled all across Egypt to recover his body, and then revived him with her magical ability. Her reputed magical power was greater than that of all other gods and goddesses, and she was said to protect the kingdom from its enemies, govern the skies and the natural world, and wield power over fate itself. This point in particular is demonstrated not only by the previous events of the game, but by her undying will to stand up to the fall and the unknown forces ahead of her as the rest of the game goes on. She's also by far the best magic user as far as stats go with the highest one by far, and she's also by far the best healer in the game. Whether or not she's the best support is debatable, but I'd say she's that as well. Her having power over fate itself is really big when you think about the fact that fate brought her into the fight against the dark hour and the shadows itself. Even though her father had no choice but to let the shadows go, and despite his insistence on not going after the shadows released, that's what happened, but Yukari resolves to fight for what she believes in and to go against the fall, no matter how small the odds of them winning really were. Isis represents healing, protection, magic, and motherhood. All of these can represent Yukari. As I mentioned before, Yukari is by far the best healer in Persona 3, she has the highest magic stat, and her personality trait is to prevent anyone dying, so she's a protector. Her protective nature is also shown in the answer, but I'll touch on that when we get there. Motherhood is the one that might be surprising, but Yukari shows interest in becoming a mom in Persona 3 during her social link, so that aspect is pretty accurate to her as well. Isis is the mother of Horus, and is said to have given birth to him in the Nile Delta, and in some stories is said to have wandered with humans to protect them. This demonstrates Isis's compassion, which can also represent how once she awakens to Isis, she becomes more compassionate too. A good example is what I mentioned way earlier on in this video, and that being how she treats Junpei. She doesn't call him Stupe anymore, and she doesn't really tease him much at all as the story goes on. It's a good demonstration of the growth of her heart, and why she awakened to Isis of all figures. Yukari's awakening to Isis is really cool because unlike Aegis, the previous character I analyzed, her reason for fighting actually does change drastically. At first she was just using Seas to find out the truth about her dad, but now that she's found out the truth and became so much closer to everyone, she wants to fight to finish the mess he was unable to clean up himself. It would be her way of finding closure, and I think it's really, really cool to be honest. Now that Yukari awakened to her ultimate persona, and she has a reason to fight back, she decides to help me true out in her troubling time. Like I said, Yukari understands what she's going through, and she's not going to allow her to be alone or give up. When she hears rumors of Mitsuru wanting to flake out of the Kyoto trip, she's there for her and convinces her to come back anyway, and it doesn't stop there either. During the Kyoto trip, while Mitsuru is out at the riverbank by her lonesome, Yukari comes to console her just as Makoto did for her. I'd love to let this entire scene speak for itself, but for the sake of time, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit of it. Basically, ever since that incident 10 years ago, Mitsuru's father had the look of a dead man on his face. 
and the only reason she became a Persona user in the first place was to protect him, but in her eyes, she completely failed. Now she feels like she has nothing to fight for, and now that the reason she and everyone were brought together is gone, she doesn't see any reason to be friends or be together. Now from this point, I'll let the scene speak for itself. Sorry, but we don't know that for sure yet. You know, I used to live around here. After my dad died, my mom spent all her time throwing herself at random men. I couldn't stand seeing that side of her. So I used to come out here to the riverbank to get away. <laughs> at that point, believing in my dad was all I had. Your father only did what he thought was best. He was involved in dangerous work, but in the end, he fought to make things right. He believed the shadows needed to be stopped, even if it meant losing his life. That's why I choose to fight. I'm going to destroy the Dark Hour, and finish what my dad started. Finish what he started. That's all I can do. That we can do. Right, Mitsuru-senpai? Takeba. You're right. It's not over just yet. We're going to see this through to the end. For my father's sake. And for yours. Senpai... Yukari, let's face what comes next together, okay? Of course. Honestly, I don't even feel like I need to explain how this scene is important, but I will anyway because I love talking about this game and the narrative. So Yukari at the start disliked Mitsuru a lot and was only fighting alongside Cease for her own somewhat selfish reason. But now it's the complete opposite. She fights in her father's honor after fighting the truth. And after seeing that Mitsuru isn't all that different from her, she's the one to become good friends with her and be there for her in her darkest time. Before, it was only Makoto she could open up to since they shared similar fates, but now she's opened up to Fuka and Mitsuru as well, and they're really good friends because of it. Yukari and Mitsuru's friendship is honestly one of the closest and most interesting ones in Persona for me. They are basically polar opposites in terms of personality, but their experiences and hardships brought them together when they needed it the most, and that's how the best kind of friendships start, through understanding, camaraderie, and acceptance. Now we're going all the way near the end of the game. I wasn't lying when I said we're going to be speeding up in the video, but this is mainly because a large portion of her character arc has been covered already. On December 3rd, it's revealed that Ryoji, a recent transfer student to Gekukan High, as well as friend of Makoto and Junpei, was the harbinger of the fall the whole time, and he reveals that the world is going to end by next spring, and that's only about three months away. If they kill Ryoji, they can forget till then, but if they don't, they'll have to fight Nyx. Nyx is the mother of shadows and supposedly can't be defeated, so everyone is scared as hell contemplating what to do or if it's even worth it. Now the movies and the games portray Yukari and the others differently during this time, but Yukari is definitely the most extreme example, so I'm just going to mention the movie version in case you're interested. In the game, despite being scared out of her mind, she immediately says that she doesn't want to forget everything since it would be like running away from the truth, but in the movies, it's extremely different. In this adaptation, she drowns in apathy harder than anyone else. She doesn't eat for days, secludes herself from everyone, and basically becomes a literal shell of her former self barely able to function. She acts not so different from the victims of apathy syndrome, and while she's in bed contemplating her death, her persona seemingly starts attacking her, just like it does for the members of Shrega. When a persona user loses control of their persona, it goes haywire and tries to kill the host, and that's apparently what's happening here. Thankfully, this was just an illusion brought on by unrest and lethargy from not eating or sleeping, but the fact her apathy got to that point is really telling of how bad she's off in the movie adaptation. Something to keep in mind is that in the movie, she hasn't actually seen the recording of her dad yet, so she's been fighting without a clear motive this whole time, and when she finally does see the recording, she breaks down into tears. This part of the movie is just pretty interesting and actually parallels Makoto's own characterization in Journeys in the movies in a way, so I figured I'd show it since it was wild how much darker Yukari was in this adaptation. Going back to the games though, once they have this option told for them, they call for a meeting a week after being told the decision they need to make. And Yukari ends up saying this to Junpei. What about you, Junpei? Have you decided? Nah. What's the matter? Scared? 
What the hell is wrong with you? You think this is a joke? People get really pissed at Yukari for this moment, and I can understand why, but she had zero ill intent in saying this. It was a really bad thing to say given the circumstances, but she had genuine love and care towards Junpei and the other members of Seas. So when she saw him and everyone else despairing, she tried a desperate joke to lighten the mood, but it backfired badly. It was likely a way for her to cope with the fact her life is probably going to end soon as well. She's just a sarcastic person, so that was her way of trying to do things, and she apologizes for it a moment later, showing she knew she messed up. They come to the conclusion that no one is ready to make the decision on whether to kill Ryoji or not, so they disband the meeting. Everyone afterward has their own way of coping with the situation and making their decision, and Yukari's is to talk to her new best friend Mitsuru. They both come to the conclusion that they should fight Nyx because it's better than doing nothing and giving up. She also says that she doubts Nyx is unkillable because Makoto seems unkillable as well, which is not completely wrong I guess? But that's besides the point. What the point of all of this has to do with is what she says here. You know, if things don't work out, I think I'll still be okay as long as I'm with everyone. Honestly, I don't think it matters if we live or die. All that really matters is that we're proud of how we lived. And I know I'd be proud if we decided to fight Nyx. Is this about honoring your father's legacy? Yeah, that's part of it. But mostly... It's about me and how I feel. I understand. Senpai, a while back, you asked me to face what comes next with you. You didn't forget, did you? I could never forget. We'll fight together, Yukari. Good. So yeah, Yukari basically just says even if we die, if we fight Nyx and stand proud, then she can be happy with the life she lived. If she turned her back from everything now, it would go against everything her and her father believed in, and that's just not an option. It really is just wild how far Yukari has come as a person at this point, and her character arc is just so well done in my eyes, but we are far from done. Before we can get into the actual Judgment Day against Nyx, I have to go over Yukari's social link. To be honest, I wasn't really sure where to talk about this at, but I think detailing it before the Nyx battle and giving her character arc through the journey its final conclusion would be the best way to go about it. Yukari's social link is all about her relationship with her mother, her isolation, and her relationship with Makoto. Through the support of Makoto, she's able to better understand and forgive her mother over time. In rank 1, Yukari apologizes for how she acted in Yakushima, and wishes that she and Makoto could just live normal lives without the burden of having lost her parents, or in Yukari's case having lost her dad and grown distant from her mother. She feels like Makoto can understand her and really cares, which is something I've been saying this whole video basically. In rank 2, the two of them go shopping for flowers so she can decorate her room. This rank is just a moment for them to bond, the only semi-important thing she mentions is how she would like any flowers as long as they were from him. In rank 3, the thing I mentioned about Yukari's motherhood aspect of the lover's arcana comes into play a bit. They go to Polonia Mall and see a crying kid who has lost her mother. She calmly and softly leads the kid to the police station where they're able to get the kid and the mother reunited. This angers Yukari afterward because it reminds her of her own mother. She explains that she and her mom aren't close because after her dad passed, she just throws herself at random guys to cope, and she hates that. She then says Makoto is the only one she has told, which at this point in the story that's just not true, but we'll forget that for now. This moment shows her great trust in Makoto. In rank 4, Yukari's mother calls her, and she's very direct and to the point, demonstrating just how bad the relationship is right now. She tells Yukari that she wants to get remarried, and that angers Yukari enough to end the call off without telling her to ever call again. The remarried part doesn't bother her, but the running away from her life by jumping from person to person is the bothersome part. Yukari, as I've reiterated many times, values independence and self-sustainability greatly. She doesn't want to rely on others, so she isolates herself as a result. In rank 5, Yukari gets pickpocketed and tries to confront the people on her own, and she tells Makoto not to come with her because she doesn't want any help and wants to solve her problems on her own. Of course, Makoto tells her anyway, and once he arrives, he sees three douchebags and smokes their shit to get her wallet back. She's thankful, but she also gets upset and lashes out at Makoto because she really does not like feeling helpless. She understands she's in the wrong and he was only trying to help though, so she apologizes right after and thanks him again, showing she's not just completely blind to the fact it's a shortcoming of hers. Adding on to that, in rank 6, they go to the school rooftop where Yukari apologizes again and explains what I said about hating to depend on people. But since it's Makoto and they share a good connection, she's really grateful. For the most part, that's it for rank 6. 
and in rank 7 they go to a restaurant together. They talk about planning a vacation and doing new and fun things, and that makes her really excited. She also mentions how Makoto, more so than anyone else, helps her to not feel alone, and she isn't afraid to be her true self around him. The best news is that she admits she's always trying to push people away and isolate herself because of her family situation, especially regarding her relationship with her mother, but she hasn't been doing it as bad with the help of Makoto. This is represented hella times over in the game with the Yakushima trip, her becoming closer with Fuka, and eventually becoming best friends with Mitsuru. The fact she directly acknowledges this is amazing and is a big step toward growth for her. In rank 8, Yukari gets a call from her mother regarding the remarriage. Her mom says she wants her approval before she does anything, and she says as long as it's what you want then it's fine. Her mom apologizes for everything and they agree to meet up to talk about it more in detail, and this gets Yukari really flustered and shaky. She talks herself to not back out of it by reminding herself that running away from her problems is the thing she hates the most, so she has to confront this fear inside of herself. She begins to realize that she and her mom aren't so different after all. Her mom truly loves and misses her dad, and that's why she kept throwing herself at other people to cope. She just couldn't handle it and needed a shoulder to lean on to keep her from losing it. Yukari now understands that when you lose someone, you can't just go on alone. You need support, and she finally understood this by becoming closer to Makoto and talking about her feelings. She also says loving someone means giving a part of yourself away, and I think anyone that has loved someone deeply can attest to that statement. On rank 9, Yukari asks Makoto to meet up on the rooftop once more. She says some of the things she said and talked about have been pretty awful, so it makes her question why Makoto continues to be by her side. And here you choose to become rather romantic or platonic. I chose the romantic route by saying I love you, but I'll detail the platonic route in rank 10 as well since it isn't too different. Back to this rank though, after saying I love you, she cries tears of joy and says she feels like a weight has been lifted off her shoulders. She admits she was jealous when he talked to other girls like Fuka, and that she wants his eyes to be for her and her alone. For the romantic rank 10, she invites Makoto to her room. She gives him her phone trap that she got from the opening of Moonlight Bridge, which is very, very ironic but she explains it's special because she got it from her dad. She decided to give it to him because she used to talk to it when she was alone, but since she can talk to Makoto and eventually the others now, she wanted to give it to him because she loves him. Now in the platonic route, she still has a dependency on him showing that regardless of which path you take she's grown past isolating herself from others with no good reason, and she also gives him the phone trap, but for a different reason. She gives it to him because she feels like it might help him sometime the way it helped her. So yeah, Yukari's social link is actually really amazing. Her main problem with her mother that she's brought up throughout the whole story gets resolved since she now forgives and understands her. She's no longer isolating herself the same way she used to, and in general she's just a lot more open to people and willing to talk about things. It's one of the best social links in the game in my opinion, and it really feels like a relatable and human storyline. So finally, now that Yukari's character arc throughout the journey is more or less done and dusted up to this point, we can get into the final battle against Nyx. Honestly, there isn't too much to cover here, but there are some things I'd like to show. Before they enter Tartarus for the last time, Yukari is the first to point out the fact that they'll lose their memories once they get rid of the Dark Hour, and she says this. But even if that happens, I want you all to know I won't forget you. Even if it robs us of all our memories together, I swear I'll still remember you all. They all agree to meet on top of the school during graduation day, but before they can think about all that, they have one last hurdle to cross. In this final fight, everyone is at max power and ready to kick some shadow ass, and Yukari is no exception. In the movie adaptation, Yukari, Mitsuru, Ken, and Fuka fall behind to give the rest of the team time to get to Nyx, and they have a really cool moment together, demonstrating their undying will to win. During the Nyx fight in game, she echoes similar sentiments. I'm sick of running away. Living means looking death square in the face. So I won't back down. Not even from you. After they fail to defeat Nyx, Makoto awakens to the Universe Arcana in order to save everyone, and manages to seal Nyx with this newfound power. Afterward, sees her transported to a beautiful space, and at the thought of him being dead, Yukari is the first to not believe that he's truly gone and calls out for him and gets a response indicating he's okay. They all regroup outside of Tartarus safe and sound and have a wholesome moment together. After coming out victorious, everyone forgets their memory of everything regarding the Dark Hour as Yukari pointed out before. Despite this, come March 4th, Yukari asks Makoto for help with something. 
She wants him to meet her mom with her so she can have the courage to face her and make things right after all this time. And she fears if she goes alone, she might make things worse. Whether you agree or disagree, it doesn't really matter because I, I mean, you know. Come March 5th is graduation day, the day everyone agreed to meet on the school rooftop to celebrate their win against Nyx. During the ceremony, everyone remembers their promise and they run to the roof where Makoto and Igus are already waiting for them. And well, I think we all know how this story ends. So in case you somehow aren't aware of what happens at the end of the journey, Makoto passes away almost immediately after everyone arrives to meet up. Now put yourself in the shoes of Yukari for a moment here. The person you could relate to the most. The person that consoled you in your darkest times. The person that helped you reconcile your relationship with your mom. And the person that helped you stop isolating yourself has died right before your very eyes. And you have no clue why. Yukari was already an emotionally charged person, more so than anyone else in the team, as demonstrated I don't even know how many times throughout the game and this video. So Makoto's passing hurt her in a way I could only begin to imagine. Her highest priority in combat is to protect people and prevent people from dying, and now she has seemingly failed wholeheartedly at this for the one most important to her. These feelings are only exemplified and added upon in the next chapter of Persona 3, The Answer. Now Yukari and the answer is by far one of the most misunderstood characters I have ever seen in a video game in my entire life. A lot of people hate her because they feel as though she regresses a character and acts like a bitch, and that just blows my mind because her regressing was the entire point of the answer. Everyone regressed in the answer. The answer shows how people cope and grieve over the loss of someone close, and I don't care what anybody says, the way she acts is valid considering the circumstances, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. We need to actually go over what happens first before we can discuss this. So the answer takes place on March 31st, and as everyone is gathering their evokers on the last day of being in the dorm, Yukari is absent because she has cram practice, she says. The following night, as basically everyone besides Yukari and Akihiko celebrate their last day, something odd happens at midnight. The clock rolls back to March 31st yet again, as if they're in a time loop. Mitsuru calls Yukari and Akihiko to come to the dorm just in case. And thank god she did. An unknown figure by the name of Metis arrives and starts attacking everyone. And as she's about to kill Ken, Igis awakens to the power of the wild card and inherits Orpheus to defeat Metis. She claims that she's trying to protect Igis, which you know obviously she can't be trusted at this moment in time. Once Igis wakes up from exhaustion, Yukari and Akihiko have arrived at the dorm, thus beginning the main events of the answer. So Yukari and the answer is way more aggressive. Like I'm talking no sarcasm, no nothing, just straight hands type stuff. Well she isn't actually trying to put hands on anyone, but you get what I mean. The main dungeon of the answer is called the Abyss of Time. And this is a place that spawned due to the regret of the team's feeling over Makoto's death. Since the cause of death was unknown, and he was the only casualty, they can't help but regret the way things turned out. And as I mentioned before, everyone deals with this in different ways. Yukari herself wants to end the abyss of time as fast as possible and move on forward without looking back at the past. Or so she says. As they explore the abyss of time to find out more about the place and try to find a way out of the time loop, they come across doors that have flashbacks for each of the party members. They reflect the moment the team essentially awakened to their power and chose to fight the shadows. Yukari's door shows her receiving a letter from her father dated 10 years ago when the Moonlight Bridge opening ceremony commenced. This is when she had resolved to find out the truth of what had happened and awaken to her persona. After that, she says once Igis awakened to the wild card and inherited it from Makoto, it made her anxious to find a sign of her own growth, and she mentions how she made a personal promise to him. Once they open the final door, it reveals the moment Igis awakened to the wild card, which is her nightmare she's had ever since the passing of Makoto, where she calls for him but can never catch him. 
She then wished to be a machine rather than deal with the pain. Shortly thereafter, the source of all their pain and regret comes face to face with them, and that's none other than Makoto himself. Well, a shadow form, but it's him alright. After they defeat him, everyone is given a key, and with this key they are given two options. The first is to open the entrance to the dorm and return things the way they are supposed to be in the present, or to open the door to Makoto's former room and go back in time to before he sacrificed himself to defeat Nyx. The problem is, everyone has to choose the same door to open. Without all of them together, nothing will happen, and not everyone can come to an agreement. Yukari is the big one here. They return to the lounge, and normally I wouldn't let something this long play out in full, but to be honest, this is just too important to cut corners. You're all about the here and now, right, Yukatan? I mean, you say it all the time. You gotta look forward. I... I want to go back to the time before the last battle. When I thought about how he protected us, I kept telling myself that I have to keep looking forward. That's why I started going to cram school and spending less time goofing off. But I can't lie to myself. If there's a way for him to come back, I'll take it, no matter what. Yukari. So, you're giving up? Are you saying you don't have the strength to face reality? After all the things we've gone through, you're just gonna throw in the towel in the fight against yourself? Oh yeah, you're really one to be throwing around all those high-minded ideals. If you really thought something was that precious to you, you'd want to protect it no matter what. Don't you understand? We can go back and fix things. Are you seriously just gonna let a chance like this go? Then I'll ask you this. If I said I wanted to undo your father's death, would you do it? Even if there was a way to reverse Shinji and Miki's death, I'd flat out refuse. Nothing in the past was a waste. You're just making excuses. <sighs> anyway, what do the rest of you think? I don't know. I get second thoughts when I think about going back to when Chidori died. But I definitely see what Akihiko Senpai is trying to say. When you get down to it, though, I, I hate to say this, but I'm just too scared to do that battle over. What's wrong with you? Are you saying you're scared to die, but it's okay if he does? That's not what I said. I mean, have you really thought this through? Going back to before that battle means we have to fight Nyx again. Did you ever think about what might happen if we lose this time? It's the same thing. Either way, all it means is that you're just scared. And you two are no better. All that talk about accepting the present is because when you get down to it, you only care about yourselves. So Yukari admits that she straight up just wants to go back and isn't taking no for an answer. She feels like letting this chance go is cowardice and means you're running away from your problems and feelings, and she's willing to fight everyone and take their key by force to make it happen. Now while this is 100% regression of her character, it's still in line with everything she believes in and went through in the journey. She has always felt that running from your problems is the worst thing you can do, and in her eyes, letting Makoto die was the biggest mistake of her life essentially. She's completely indebted to him and can't accept the fact he's gone, so she blindly fights for the chance to see him again. Obviously choosing to go back would be foolish considering the fallen Nyx would come back, but do you seriously think a person grieving is going to be able to make solid choices on their own? Think back to her social link for a moment. In rank 8, she admits herself that you cannot cope with something like loss well alone. It was the whole reason she came to respect her mom for acting the way she did. She has me true in the others, but right now, she's just not in a place to be consoled or talked to in that way. She wants to fight and open that door. And in the emotional state she's in, there's just not much that's going to stop her. Mitsuru decides to help Yukari because she wants to be there for her and support her decision no matter what, since she has done so much for her. Well, it turns out, Igis and Metis, after having a special moment of their own, get their own power up emotionally and are able to defeat Yukari and Mitsuru, at which point the true key is formed. And again, I'm just going to let a lot of this scene speak for itself. I, I 
made a promise to him too. I promised that I'd try my best to change this world so that people would stop wishing for the fall. It wasn't like yours. It was something I promised myself while holding his cold hand. That's why I decided to put the past behind me and look forward. Corazon. But I can't. I can't be that person. I want to see him. I don't care about anything else. I just want to see him again. Yukari-san. Yukari, there's no way to truly put the past behind you. In the end, you only succeed in running from it. It's painful to face, but if you don't, your wounds will never heal. So if I keep facing it, someday everything will be okay? Eventually I'll forget all about him, or stop caring? Like that's ever gonna happen. No one knows that better than us. <sighs> You're right. But can't we be there for you when things are at their worst? The way you were there for me last year. Huh? That may not have been what you meant at the time. But even now, I consider your being at my side last year as one of the most cherished moments of my life. That's why, when we lost him without being able to thank him, I swore deep down, if something ever happened to make you suffer, I'd put my own feelings aside and stand with you. Mitsuru Senpai. Yukari, to lose someone you had such a strong bond with is agony. But there's no need to suffer alone. You have us with you. Isn't that the whole point of forming such bonds? Yukari, after losing Makoto, wanted to make the world a better place and prevent anything like the fall from happening again. But she just couldn't cope alone. If Mitsuru hadn't been there for her at that moment, it's hard to tell where Yukari might have ended up. I'm sure they would have learned the truth about what happened to Makoto regardless, but when it comes to her feelings and mental state, I'm doubtful it would have ever recovered. She would have continued to hold regret for his death until her own death arrived one day. After accepting what Mitsuru said, she alongside everyone else seeks the truth behind what happened to Makoto on that fateful day against Nyx. They open the last door, and it shows them that he used his power to seal Nyx from the will of the masses that wish for her to return, and Yukari reveals that she wished for death at some point as well. I think I understand. When your life loses its meaning, the fact of death can be kind of comforting. That lurking malice we're unaware of is strong enough to give birth to such a huge monster. And maybe, that's just how it is these days. They decide to fight the will of the masses and actually defeat it. The monster hasn't disappeared forever, but Aegis points out that she's sure it can be fully defeated someday. Yukari then admits to Aegis that she was jealous of her for receiving Makoto's power. She was jealous, something that bothered her greatly throughout the journey as well. She was jealous that Mitsuru's father got to live, jealous that Makoto might be interested in other girls, and despite that, she recognized she was wrong every time. And this moment is no exception. Not only that, the blindness that came as a result of her grief has faded away as well. She understands that Makoto had to do it to save the world, and there was no alternative. With this new context of his death in her mind, she can see it in a much more positive light, and that gives her the strength to move forward and stop regretting the past. Once they use the key on the dorm entrance to return to the normal world, the truth of Aegis and Metis is revealed, and it's questioned whether Aegis will live now that she's got her answer to life. Before they return to the dorm, Yukari is the first to realize what might happen as a result in panics, and even when they do return to the dorm, she's the first by Aegis' side. When she wakes up finally, she says this to Aegis. We were so close to each other. We suffered over the same things. <laughs> I feel pretty stupid now. I wonder why we both thought we were all alone. I guess we're more like each other than we thought. The following day, once everything returns to normal, Aegis cancels her transfer to the lab and decides to enroll in Gekukon High to be a third year. She wants to experience the world with everyone more, and Yukari offers to be her roommate because they're friends. I mean, you need one, right? But hey, 
No need to be so formal. We are friends, aren't we? Yeah, you're right. And that right there just proves why I think Yukari is so damn misunderstood. Yes, she regressed, but she quite literally admits that everything she felt and everything she did was foolish. She sees that she was in the wrong, and she now has an even deeper love and appreciation for Aegis, the one she held malice toward not even a moment ago. It's almost like grief and sorrow can cloud the way you think about things or something. The whole point of Persona is to be there for your friends in their dark times, and as soon as someone did that for Yukari, she changed, which reinforces the entire point of the franchise. Anyways, with that small tirade of mine done, Yukari's character arc is now complete, and boy was it a good ass character arc. When I started writing this, I really didn't expect it to come out to this length, but I just kept finding more things I wanted to talk about with her. Going from someone using C's for her own somewhat selfish reasoning to what she is by the end of the answer that we just covered is honestly one of my favorite examples of the growth of a character basically ever. Through all of her ups and downs, everything remained consistent in her thoughts and actions, and in my opinion, her motives in life felt like some of the more realistic ones in the series. I think her being as emotional as she was throughout the game was something a lot of people could relate to, because that's just kind of human nature. Of course, not everyone would be as emotional as her, but that's just a part of her charm if you ask me personally, and her social link and just overall story were so satisfying because of all of this. Her personas Eo and Isis represented her so perfectly that it was honestly a lot of fun to read and make the connections. They really reflected her protective nature, and when you really think about it, Isis can explain why she wanted him to come back so badly. Isis roamed all across Egypt to find Osiris's, her husband's body parts, and then revived him with her magical ability. It can explain why she wanted to go back and save Makoto as well, since she had this deep love and desire for him, and just to protect those close to her in general. The way the backstory of the lovers reflected who she was with her character arc was just perfect as well. Breaking down the wall of isolation, coming to accept her mother for needing help in a dark time, and she herself coming to rely on others like Fuka, Makoto, and Mitsuru as the game progressed was honestly kick ass and I really enjoyed seeing it all develop. Her learning the truth about her dad as well and fighting for what he and herself wanted too? Oh my god man, don't even get me started, I just think it's peak honestly. Yukari went from a girl searching for the answer to her father's death to finding that answer through many ups and downs and moments of deception. From a girl that would isolate herself because of her fear and morals, to accepting her mother and herself for needing help. From a girl that really disliked someone like Mitsuru, to becoming friends with that very same person after realizing her faults. She was not and is not by any means perfect, but that's what gives her and all of the Persona cast their own personal charm. I don't want to keep running around in circles saying the same things over and over again though, so I'm just going to leave it at that. But I want to hear what you all think. Did you enjoy Yukari as a character? Did you enjoy the answer? Are you excited to see the answer get remade? As always, I love hearing what you all have to say on these videos, so I'm going to reply to every single comment you all drop. And I also want to thank you all for the support on the Makoto and Aegis analysis videos. It really truly means a lot to me. With all of that said, that's about all I've got in me for this video. If you enjoyed it, why not consider dropping a like and a subscribe? I would really truly appreciate it. Alright y'all, it's been your boy Yandere Gogeta, and I will see you in the next video. Peace out, and have a great day.